there was one hero in Overwatch whose creation you could start by traveling back in time, which one would you choose? While I am certain that your favorite hero is going to significantly impact who you make your target, I feel like the vast majority of us can agree on the fact that there is one character in this game that was designed with the explicit purpose of removing all the fun from the game. If you play any of the heroes in Overwatch that actually use cool abilities, so uh, not Widowmaker, chances are that you hate Sombra about as much as I do. Now listen, you don't need to be a Zenyatta main to dislike what Sombra can do to you and your team. Anywhere on the spectrum of poking you in the backline to making your team C9 the card, it's like there's not a dang thing she can do that isn't annoying. It really hammers home the fact that Blizzard designs characters by how much fun they are, as long as they have fun for the one playing them. And in the case of Sombra, the real fun is making sure that nobody else in the lobby can derive even an ounce of enjoyment out of the game. I mean, don't get me wrong, depending on the character you play, there definitely is outplay potential to be had. And trust me when I say that there are few things as satisfying as shutting down a Sombra aiming to ruin your day. But some characters have less defensive capabilities than others, meaning that what is a general nuisance to one can be a reason to alt the four for somebody else. It's one thing to get outplayed via means of a big brain body block, utilizing every tool in your arsenal to come out ahead on any given engagement. But no person in their right mind ever said, ah yes, the way Sombra held down right click to not allow me to play the video game, that was a very fun encounter. While I do admit that I'm the reason for many a Sombra switch in my own games, because a man can only be so altered so often before they snap, I have to say that there is a reason for my repeated turn to the dark side as well. A reason you will find on our last episode. With the introduction of a brand new Sigma skin came not only the desire to want to obtain a new cosmetic, but also the wish to earn it. Of course, just winning 9 games was way too easy, so I decided that a suitable challenge would be trying to unlock that skin by using a hero that I've next to no experience playing, Sigma himself. My very first game in the Sigma Maestro challenge put me up against Bella the Sombra player, and let me tell you, I was not having a good time. But if there's one thing I'm not, it's a quitter. While I'm not going to spoil the result of that match, I will tell you that, following that episode, I have successfully obtained Sigma's new skin without resorting to playing another character. No matter how much my duo begged me to switch, I had set myself a challenge and I was determined to complete it. And since I have achieved my goal, it is time for some karmic retribution. That Sombra filled matchup left me with a sour taste in my mouth, and the only way to remove it was by tasting the sweet nectar that is playing Sombra myself. The last time we decided to play the fun police, we were targeting a very specific player that shot me granted the pleasure that is playing the video game. But this time, our goal is not quite that noble. Rather than targeting somebody who specifically chose to play a hero that also isn't fun to play against, our goal is to cause as much havoc as humanly possible. Balls swirling around, I stop those. Fara hugging a cloud, I drop those. Roadhog chasing me down to try and stop my hacking spree, I dodge those. My god, can you imagine how confused that guy must be? Anyway, point being, if there is a hero that relies on their abilities to function, you can be certain that I was on their tail. And if that means following up a hack with an EMP, then by Jeff, consider it done. Though my favorite part here is the fact that the ball just decided to run away once the EMP wore off, subsequently feeding the Baptiste that saved his life to the wolves. <sighs> I know how that feels. Considering I know how that feels, what do you think is going to happen when I encounter a lonely Zenyatta player in the back line? Am I going to A, solo EMP him, B, use my ultimate specifically on him, or C, ask him to smash that like button? Leave your vote down in the comment section below. I'm so sorry. Listen, those of you who know me also know that I go to great lengths to support my fellow Zenyatta players, but eventually it gets frustrating to see the enemies always peel for each other while I am left inspecting the floor. So if I don't get to have fun playing Zenyatta, neither does that guy. But I'm not all bad, I promise. I mean, as much as I'm denying the enemy team the luxury of being able to use their abilities, I'm also very selflessly handing out POTGs to my own teammates who decide to follow up on it. And it is moments like these that you come across like-minded players who, just like yourself, devote themselves to screwing over the red team as much as possible. Our story today takes place on Eichenwald. Funky name pronunciations aside, being a hybrid game mode, you can be certain that I'm feeling quite at home on this map. And as much as I have to wonder why the heck Jeff decided to pick a name that is impossible to pronounce properly for anyone outside of Germany, none of that takes away from how much I love playing on this map. While my heritage would allow me to tell you how to actually pronounce it, I'm not going to stop butchering that name until Blizzard finally stops bastardizing my culture. I mean, for Jeff's sake, this skin is literally named after our national animal, and yet there's no eagle to be found. And I'm sorry, but this is not how you pronounce that name. Bro, don't even get me started on the recipes in the Overwatch cookbook. Either way, none of that matters now because the only thing that does matter is making the red team regret ever queuing into our lobby. And considering the fact that they decide to roll out with a Zenyatta, it looks like I'm going to have a field day. Between me on Sombra, Kahiko on Brig, and what is most assuredly going to turn out to be a DPS Moira, our squad was definitely on the same page about what is going to happen in this match. As the attackers leap towards the objective, 
if I was looking for a target and a good opportunity to strike. The enemy Zenyatta may feel comfortable now, but all that is going to change once I decide to strike from the shadows. The first engagement, even as a Sombra, is always meant to test the waters. What kind of team am I facing? How do they react to this kind of play? Are they confident at aiming? I may not have succeeded in obtaining an elimination, but this was merely the beginning. I'm about to live in that Zenyatta's head and I'm most assuredly not planning to pay rent. The distance between my translocator and their backline was fairly negligible, allowing me to come back and harass the supports time and time again. A repeated backline poking took away a lot of their attention, meaning that while they were busy fending me off, their frontline would crumble due to a lack of healing. Even without a massive killstreak, everything was going fairly well so far, but when I returned to annoy them some more, I found that my get out of jail free card had been destroyed mid-engagement. I hadn't realized that the mini health pack room was turned into a battleground with my translocator becoming a casualty, and with no means of escape at the ready, I would fall victim to the support line that I was trying to harass. The attacker's frontline would finally be granted the undivided attention of the supports, meaning that it was time for the rest of my team to pick up the slack while I was respawning. At this point, all I could do is hope that they don't collapse under the pressure. As I rushed out of spawn to come to the assistance of my team, I couldn't help but feel embarrassed about the rookie mistake I made. How could I be so foolish as to leaving my translocator in plain sight? I had to hurry back to the choke point before that miss by cost us more than just my life. All I needed was a bit more time to cover the distance and my Sigma would be the one to grant my wish. To stop the red team in their tracks, he uses gravitic flux in the choke point and forced the enemy Zenyatta to blow his transcendence. The robot monk having used his ultimate meant go time for my EMP to crush their hopes of getting past the choke. Without being able to use their defensive abilities, my Zarya's Graviton Surge will prove to be more lethal than the Gravitic Flux they had just survived. No fun also meant no survivors, leading us to aggressively push towards their spawn to make sure that none of them live to tell the tale. We had successfully stabilized our position, but to make sure that we continued to dominate, I had to try and keep them on the respawn train. Their low HP Zarya was an easy target to clean up, but when I saw that their Zenyatta was coming out of spawn to challenge me, I felt it was necessary to teach him a lesson. So far in this game, I have merely been an annoyance to him, since his Ana was the determined to keep him alive no matter how often I tried to go for an assassination. My ability to see low HP targets was on par with his discord orb allowing him to know my exact location, but the difference in hitbox sizes is what ultimately would dictate the victory of this 1v1. Desperation began to set into the minds of the attackers as an offensive bastion pick was meant to be the saving grace that keeps him in the game. My backline assaults have finally borne fruit since it prompted most of their team to stop what they're doing to try and make sure I can't further harass their supports. As noble of a goal as that may be, it also left their bastion completely defenseless, allowing our Reaper to add yet another head to his collection. The main tank realized that drastic measures had to be taken if they want to avoid this being turned into a first point full hold, but the means by which he can create space are fairly limited. He popped his ultimate to first try and disrupt our front line, then peel for the back line, and ultimately, in an act of sheer desperation, he decided to leap towards the objective to force us to contest it. Come on, just... Just a bit more. Ah, here we go. The unfortunate part for him is that our Reaper had seen this play coming miles away, meaning that a simple shadow step was enough to invalidate most of his effort. Well, that is what I would like to say. Because at the end of the day, it still forced us to contest him, and it was that window of opportunity the enemies used to fire back at us and finally obtain some worthwhile eliminations. Our choke point hold was in shambles, and all we could muster to achieve was trickling in one by one to stall, but that would only delay the inevitable. The attackers had finally captured the first point, meaning that the ball was now on their court. The attackers had turned our spawn camp around in remarkable fashion, leading whoever survived that assault to scramble and save their lives. Not knowing how far they would be able to take that snowball, I decided to toss my translocator quite far into the map, a decision I would later come to regret. While I was visibly shook by the enemy team's sudden increase in confidence, my Sigma decided to take matters into his own hands and establish another foothold at yet another choke point. Minibot made use of that ultimate to begin cleaning house, and thanks to the strength and leadership of our tanks, we were back in business when it comes to pushing towards the enemy's spawn. On. If the red team thinks that we're done playing the fun police only because they capped the first point, then they would be solely mistaken. We decided to split into two squads with group A hunting down the fleeing supports and group B pushing towards the spawn doors once again. Destruction followed everywhere we went and while our Sigma was spamming the full back voice line, the rest of our team decided that we weren't done spawn camping yet. Hacking the enemy Genji to turn him to a free kill for my Reaper was certainly fun, but the creme de la creme would be my Zarya's bull graviton search that, more than anything else, really hammered home who was in control 
of this match. As I was chasing down the enemy Lucio, I started to think about how allowing them to cap the first point may be even more BM than just outright full holding. Wouldn't it be even more demoralizing to think that you have a shot at winning, just to then continue getting spawn camped? My mind wandered in strange directions of what I could only assume was the result of playing way too much DPS. Ultimate after ultimate and push after push would see us coming out ahead of each and every engagement. If I didn't know any better, I'd almost think that we are the attacking team, considering how much time we spent around that spawn room. But to my surprise, we hadn't extinguished the flame of defiance just yet. The enemy Genji had positioned himself very sneakily to force me to use my translocator, the location of which was still very far away from the choke since we haven't been losing any fights. I had a long ways to go to return to the fight once again, which created an opportunity for the red team to strike back. With a nanoblade in hand, LG7 was tearing through our front line and that was the play they needed to finally allow them to effectively leave their spawn. Meanwhile in the card, Headhunter continued to stall out the opposition to make sure we didn't have to forsake the choke point again, but when the enemy Widowmaker returned, that stall would come to a swift end. With our forces staggering onto the objective, the attackers were in a prime position to group up and eliminate us in one fell swoop, a chance they wouldn't want to miss out on as they invested their ultimates to make sure that the age of spawn camping was finally over. But we weren't so easily beaten. I wouldn't allow my confidence to slip again even in the face of disgusting misplays because I still had a duty to fulfill. Just like my tanks kept us in the game after we lost the first point, it was now in my hands to allow us to stop the enemies before they advanced too far. My translocator was boldly placed right below the enemies to make sure I can come back and stall for as much time as possible. And just like my Sigma had bought me the time to come back with a game-changing EMP, I had done the same for him as he flanked the opposition to take to the skies for another Gravitic Flux. Playtime was over as Mini and I comboed for another EMP Graviton that would make for the final nail in the coffin. Our eliminations were just staggered enough with only 30 seconds left on the clock that the attackers would not be able to properly regroup, let alone combine their ultimates. For one last time in this match, we planted our no fun allowed flag on the ground by pushing towards their spawn and crushing any hopes for a last second comeback. The enemy Genji was the only one able to dodge us and try to make a play by using Dragon Blade, but at this point you could tell their spirits were broken and the card would remain untouched. Victory was ours, but more importantly than that, our our team made sure that if we cannot have fun, neither can the enemies. The end. Oh my god, playing Sombra makes me feel so dirty. Well, glad that episode is over. But hey, if you found yourself enjoying this one, do let me know by dropping me a like on your way out. Consider subscribing if you want to see more, and definitely hit that bell icon to not miss out on the next episode. I hope you guys have a fantastic day, and until next time, peace.